Welcome everyone. We're so glad that you're joining us this evening. My name is Johanna and I'm with the Washington Environmental Council and I'll be getting us started today. This will be a moderated conversation among a group of experts with our fantastic moderator, Emily Washines, asking questions. Today's topic is what's going on with the Snake River salmon and farms. We're going to discuss the largest river restoration opportunity in history, the regional benefits of stopping salmon extinction, the impacts that restoration will have on farmers, and the solutions we can find together if we have the courage to have the conversation. These aren't easy issues to discuss together, but we're doing it here today. Future conversations will focus on energy, transportation, and a variety of other topics. You can sign up for those webinars at snakeriverdinnerhour.com. You're also welcome to drop questions in the chat or the Q&A, although please know that this isn't just a panel discussion, it's a conversation. We may not get to your question, but our moderating team will be reading them all and we will take them into account for future webinars and conversations. We're also gonna have a dispatch from DC near the end of the webinar. David Dreyer, a senior policy manager at the National Wildlife Federation, will share updates on policies coming out of DC. And to wrap up, we'll have Mariska Ketchkesh, an organizer with the Sierra Club, share some opportunities to provide public input on this process. We're honored to have Emily Washines moderating today. Emily is a scholar and enrolled Yakima Nation tribal member with Cree and Skokomish lineage. Her blog, Native Friends, focuses on history and culture. She's a board member of the Museum of Culture and Environment and Columbia Riverkeeper. She's also an adjunct faculty at Yakima Valley College. Thank you, Emily, for being here today. I'll pass it off to you. Thank you, Johanna. I'm uh, glad to be here today to have this talk and I'm going to introduce the panelists today. Uh, we have Blaine Meek. He's the area manager for Agri Northwest. Blaine was raised on a family farm and dairy in Southeast Idaho and graduated from Brigham Young University with a BS in finance from the Marriott School of Business. Blaine has also been pursuing his passion of farming for 24 years and currently raises, processes potatoes, carrots, onions, sweet corn, green peas, corn, and wheat with water pumped from Lake Sacagawea behind Ice Harbor Dam. Blaine and his wife, Rochelle, have been married for 21 years and have eight children. Next, we have Joel Kawahara. He's a commercial fisherman working in Washington and Alaska. He is an active board member of the Coastal Trollers Association, and he has sat on the board of Save Our Wild Salmon for many years. Joel also serves on the board of the Alaska Trollers uh, um, Association and has served for more than a decade as the member of Habitat Committee for the Pacific Fisheries Management Council. David Canamella is a retired fisheries biologist who grew up fishing, first in the ocean with his father's side and the, next to his family later. His oldest brother got him started fishing for trout. Dave spent 25 years working for the Idaho Department of Fish and Game, including as a fisheries biologist and later as a nature center superintendent. And we have Lisa McShane. She is a contractor for American Rivers who works for tribal nations, environmental organizations, and community foundations. She's also a professional artist. Her large scale landscape oil paintings are in collections throughout the United States and her painting of the Horse Heaven Hills was on display in the U.S. Embassy in Yemen. And I want to uh, thank our panelists for being here and of course all the audience members who are letting us know where you're from and your a little bit of your background. Some of you are farmers I see in there as well. Uh, let's start it off with some questions. So for the whole group, before we jump into the details, we're all food people. Uh, when I read Blaine's uh, bio, I just got really hungry. <laughs> I don't know how many of you in the audience got hungry. So we're all food people. We're in the food hour. Uh, Joel, you fish for uh, salmon. Uh, of course, we have um, a number of people that because of all this food, this rich agriculture and traditional food area, let's us 
let's hear about some of your favorite recipes and maybe some that you want to share to help kick this off. Complain, you're muted. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I I love potatoes. If, if I, we, I grow a lot of things, but if people ask me, I usually say I'm a potato farmer. And I joke that I could keep up with, with Bubba from Forbes Gump. Uh, I could give him more potato recipes than he gives shrimp recipes. So lots of good things with potatoes. That's great. Um, I'm also a big potato lover and I uh, cooked a lot, of course, with the uh, St. Patrick's Day. We had to have the corned beef with potatoes and cabbage mixture maybe I don't know if any came from your farm or not I didn't I didn't look and see if Blaine Meek was on the package <laughs> um I'm gonna put mine in the the chat uh, it's a salmon uh patty a recipe that I I use from Flav City I like it because they also have a YouTube channel where I can watch it um uh, Dave or Lisa, do you have a, or Joel, do you have a recipe or preparation you'd like to share? Yes, I'm going to drop my pea salad recipe in the chat because uh, Blaine uh, a couple of weeks ago told me he had just planted peas. And I was like, well, what kind of peas? You know, because I, you know, all the varieties and peas, like frozen peas. And it's like, that's perfect. That's what could be better. That's great. Dave, I know uh, you, we were talking about your background before we got started yeah. here. My recipe is in the chat. And what I said is when you have things like fish and razor clams, just let them do the talking. A little bit of salt, pepper, maybe some lemon. But I put a salmon uh, recipe in there, a little pesto brush, mm -hmm. a little basil and olive oil you brush on the fish and just grill it. And do not, do not, do not overcook it. <laughs> Good. Well, I, this is Joel. I will, um, I will agree with Dave about do not overcook it. I, um, and this is specifically salmon. I really like uh, doing it on an open fire when that's um, you know practical. With with a barbecue, you can get a caged style um, uh, grilling uh, machine or whatever. <clears throat> and the therefore you can turn the salmon i'm sorry i didn't describe that very well you don't need much uh dressing on the salmon if it's uh, really nice fresh fish it's just salt and a little bit of pepper and then you might put some lemon on when you're uh, eating it but over over a fire out in the open is really the most fun yeah, I agree. Is there a specific type of um, wood that you prefer to cook the salmon with? Um, on, in Western Washington, it's always um, alder. Mm. Uh, same here. I echo that as well. Well, uh, Joel and Blaine, you're both uh, food producers. Um, and we want to hear more about you know, what you bring to the plate. Well, th thank you. Um, the thing I wanted to mention, I guess, to start with, I'm not sure if everyone realizes just what an amazing agriculture area the, the Columbia Basin is. It's incredibly productive. Um, we, we often talk about uh, corn coming from different places. Washington State is actually the highest producing state in the United States for corn. A lot of people don't realize that. We're the highest producing state for potatoes. Uh, my friends in Idaho don't like me to tell them that. They're better marketers, I think, but, uh, but we can outproduce them. And, and that comes back to our, our great soil, uh, our really high quality water, and uh, the long growing season we get with our, our long summer nights. So um, that, that's the, the main thing I wanna share. There's a reason all these food crops are grown uh, up here in the Columbia Basin. It's just incredibly productive and, and one of the best places to farm in the United States. Joel? Um, well, uh, the Columbia Basin formerly was, before development, 
the, the premier salmon river uh, in the United States, probably in the world. Uh, but more importantly, uh, if we go forward with uh, Snake River Dam removal and having to replace the important services that it provides to residents of the basin while we strive to recover salmon uh, to their former, close to their former abundances, uh, the mitigations that are going to be required are going to be very extensive uh, and expensive. And there are hundreds, literal, literally hundreds of people with different ideas about what that mitigation is going to look like for stakeholders uh, such as Blaine. Um, salmon fishermen are experts in failed mitigations. Uh, salmon hatcheries are what we have now. They're a, they're a crutch, a kind of a sad little crutch. And um, I don't think anybody should go through that as, uh, as salmon are being restored in, in terms of the other stakeholders in the basin. I wanna see a fair, equitable and adequate mitigation for all the stakeholders in the basin as salmon are, as salmon are restored. That's kind of the biggest thing I think I bring, excuse me, bring to the plate. Yeah, um, and on that note, Dave and Lisa, Joel and Blaine both talked about uh, a lot of their values and Joel also talked about stakeholder values. Uh, what do you have to share about and add to uh, that topic of, of stakeholders and their values or even your values? I'll share a little bit about my uh, my background. Um, my uh, great grandparents uh, settled a wheat farm uh, near Connell, and uh, it's still in the family. And uh, wheat is shipped on uh, the Snake River, um, and that's my mother's side. And on my father's side, uh, they were orchardists who uh, my great grandparents also settled near White Bluffs, and. Um, my grandparents were condemned off their land to create Hanford Nuclear Reservation. So um, uh, my family goes back a few generations, uh, not as long as yours, Emily. It's it just, I'm always um, uncomfortable saying how little, you know, laying claim to any land um, that, that was settled. But, um, uh, but I, um, my husband and I um, uh, moved to Bellingham and uh, he's a geologist. Uh, we raised our kids there and we raised our kids among fishermen. And so I, um, you know, I, I, I see both sides and I value both sides. I, um, I, I've seen the decline in fishing firsthand. Um, I, you know, the, the fishing fleet in Bellingham is, you know, it's, um, it's really declined. And, uh, and, you know, I, I want both to thrive. And, and I, I know um, breaching the dams and making changes are, um, it would not be easy. It's, you know, it's, it's hard. And I respect, um, really respect Blaine having this conversation. This is not our first conversation. I have valued all the conversations and respect um, you for willing, being willing to talk with me about it. Um, and, uh, but I, I think, you know, it, I, 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 to me, it's important that, that all of these, you know, that all of these, both industries do well together, that the communities thrive. I, I'll start with this, if you all can see that. That's yeah. my daughter, <laughs> that's my daughter, Madeline, and me on the South Fork of the Salmon River back in the few times when we were able to fish for Chinook on the South Fork. And if anyone has ever done that, uh, you don't have thumbprints left because the fish have burned those off trying to stop them on your reel. But uh, a couple of things I picked up on, and I spent most of the day outside working in the garden. And when you do that, you think a lot, which is dangerous. But uh, one thing I picked up on that Joel said, and I, I mean that uh, Blaine said, and I was thinking about is, he talked about incredible productivity. And you know, the river as a river, was incredibly productive and will be productive again. I mean, that river will bring salmon uh, with their protein and their omega-3 fatty acids uh, to our feet and our, uh, and our plates, if we can land the darn things. Uh, so, you know, my approach to this that you all know is we can have it both ways. 
uh, Blaine and his, uh, the people he represents, and, and the, I take nothing away from the farmers. I mean, we all eat uh, off of those fields and I would never minimize the importance of that productivity and the work that you do, uh, Blaine. Uh, but Blaine and, and those people, they need the water. They don't necessarily need the impoundments. And so we, the way I look at it is we engineered our way into this and it's an engineering challenge to get out of it. Uh, the water is still there. No one wants to see uh, any of the farmers not have their water, but uh, we can have the river and have those fish and all of the benefits. Orca doesn't have to starve to death. Uh, all the creatures that, and plants and that, that depend on salmon can have their fill because salmon are built to feed everything from gravel to gravel. Uh, the fertility, uh, fertility of the land is dependent on those uh, marine nutrients that those fish bring to us. So, you know, our challenge uh, is one, and it's an opportunity. I was glad to hear Johanna use the word opportunity because this is a golden opportunity in my view to have it both ways and all of these values. And I can't speak, it's not my place to speak for uh, the native peoples, uh, but I, I do think it's my place to recognize the importance uh, of salmon as a cornerstone, as a pillar uh, of their existence, their spiritual, uh, emotional, physical, cultural uh, existence. So uh, to talk about the values of salmon, uh, we can't disconnect economy from ecology, from culture, uh, from traditions. Uh, even for people like myself, who's this tradition is very young. It's very important to me. Uh, and I won't kill the rest of the hour, but I could. Oh, that's great, Dave. And, um, you know, I, on my in-law side, they are farmers um, as well. Our family leases different land in this area. And I will say that I haven't brushed up on my irrigation system since 11th grade horticulture. So I'm hoping that Blaine can help us, you know, learn more about this connection between agriculture. Um, how does your irrigation system work? Um, do you pump? Is it a well? How much water? You know, what? Give us a, a idea of what that entails, including agriculture and dams. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk. The farm that I'm uh, associated with has sixteen thousand acres. But I want to kind of speak to the, there's about 50,000 acres, as, as was mentioned in the chat, that is pumping out of Lake Sacagawea. And so all those acres would be very much in the same boat as my farm is. So the, the first part of it is, is rather straightforward. So we are pumping directly from the Snake River. We have a, an irrigation platform uh, that's on the river. And Lisa's been out and, and looked at it with me, and I'd invite anyone else who'd like to, to stop by. Uh, farmers love to show off their farms, so I'd, I'd be happy to show anyone around. Um, so if the, if the, the dams were removed, obviously the, the water level would drop significantly. And so where my pump station sits now would be, would be high and dry. So you would have to lower the level um, we believe it'd be in the neighborhood of 70 feet um, that you'd have to go down. And so there's kind of a couple things to, to think about with that. Um, obviously our pumps are feeding a, a whole system of pipes that's taking out uh, the water onto the farm into the sprinkler systems and getting those pumps back into a spot that they can, they can pump the water again would be necessary. And a couple of the challenges that I, that I know would be created that, that are not easy, easily solved is the reality of the silt that is built up behind those dams. And so that, that riverbed is gonna be unstable, I guess is the best word I can, I can come up with um, for a time as it, as it re, uh, redoes its channel and refigures out where it's gonna be. And so there's, there's gonna be a period of time where you can't just set up and, and have a known. Um, and then, so, so anyway, water availability is very important. And then of course, we, we are using a lot of power uh, to lift that water up onto the farms. And so that water availability and, and power reliability are very important to us. 
Great. Uh, I think Lisa was going to ask the next question. Oh, I was. Oh, well, actually, yeah, it's. Um... <laughs> Blaine, do you have any questions for us? Because, um, you know, I, I tend to pummel you with questions and, uh, you know, and I really, you know, the, seeing the area, the pump station firsthand was um, really great. And of course, thank you for the potatoes. We, <laughs> we, <laughs> we had potatoes for, for a while after that. It was really good. Um, but do you have any questions for us? So, so something, you know, a couple of things that I think about that I, that I throw out, the reality of pumping is, is you have to have a, you somehow have to pull the water for the, for the pumps to be able to lift it out. Right. And so obviously Lake Sacagawea, it's, it's a giant tub. It's very easy to pump it. Um, when the river, uh, if those impoundments aren't there, and so the river's back to its, its normal state, you've still got to, you've got to do something to impound the water. Some people, some use a weir, some use uh, small basins. Anyway, you're going to be making some kind of impact on the river to have the pumps in there. Um, there is salmon friendly screens and there's a few things, but is that that footprint that's going to be part of the river something that the that you're comfortable with or, or is that going to have a negative effect that that will make it untenable? I think that's a good question, which I don't know. And I am happy to float that around um, to people who know more than me. Dave, do you have any thoughts on that? Like what, is there, um, you know, my, my under, um, I, you know, spoke to a couple of irrigation engineers and uh, I heard, um, you know, that is an option or um, the other thing was a need to create a slower back channel um, in the river um, to slow the water down and let the sediment drop out. Dave, do you have any thoughts on uh, that? I, I don't have a lot. I was wondering if there's a, I'm sure there's a way, but I'm wondering if there's a way to maybe get water from up, up river. Uh, I don't know, Blaine, what the volume is, so it might be crazy to think about uh, an a lot of water or a, or, a, or a pipe or something like that. Uh, but uh, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like anything that hadn't been done before. And that's kind of how I feel about the, you know, is anybody one of the questions is, is anybody pumping water the distance and the height that you would be pumping under the new scenario? And is this being done already? Is the engineering there already? Yeah, there's certainly being water being lifted to those. Obviously, the higher you lift it, the more energy it, it sure. does, but, but certainly there, there, is, there is water being lifted that far. Uh, this is Joel. I have kind of one answer for uh, for Blaine. The, one of the major benefits for a free flowing Snake River will be uh, the reduction in temperatures that fish are experiencing and also faster rate of flow, both of which will increase oxygenation for fish in the river. Uh, and the, the small impoundments I mean, we'd have to see the engineering, but definitely they're going to be minor or minuscule compared to the entirety of Lake Sacagawea and all the other foreign impoundments behind the dams on the lower Snake River. So water temperatures being reduced will provide the majority of the benefit that salmon are seeking. And this, the small little impoundments probably, if they're screened, and, and I'm sure you want that, uh, won't be an impediment to salmon, I, I would hope. Yeah, I think and I don't, sorry, I don't think silt in the long term is an issue. In the short term, you know, what we've seen from the 2000 plus dam removal projects that have occurred is uh, that that silt moves pretty quickly uh, out of the system. Now, I, I wouldn't, uh, you know, guarantee that during spring runoff, uh, you're not going to have some silt, but uh, in the long term, you're not going to have that concentration of silt that you will uh, following breach. And uh, if done properly, um, taking out those earthen portions of the dams, uh, that silt will will move down to the 
the mouth and build beaches the way it's uh, supposed to be. Uh, what do you do? Do you get much? Oh, sorry, do you get much silt now, Blaine? And if so, what do you? How do you um, deal with the silt currently? So, so it is an advantage uh, as an irrigator the the reservoir because stuff's at the bottom and I'm and I'm sucking off the top. So, so yeah, it's. I mean, there is where I grew up. We I was pumping out of the Bear River, and so it was more of that. And and mm -hmm. so the silt and the moss were were much bigger issues there and, and and some of that would change but but that's something that's not new to irrigation and you know there's there is ways of of dealing with that um maybe another one to to throw out one i i shared this antidote with with lisa this year you know we we talk about the the power side of it and 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 a power i know is a, di a different topic but for irrigators the reliability of power is a big deal and and we often talk about peak you know peak power and the the heat dome that happened this year that that uh we all got to experience at some level we we had temperatures of of as high as 118 degrees um here on the farm and the the water use was was just incredible of of what the plants needed you know during that event as you can imagine and so I actually, uh, so we were, we were using our pumps fully and I actually received a, a call from the power company um, during that time. And they said, we think, we think we're gonna have to shut you off. We're afraid we're gonna, we're gonna have a brownout. So we're gonna have to shut you off. And the, the implications to that could go beyond, you know, even just the 50,000 acres of Lake Sacagawea. We have foods that for, for a mechanical issue, there's an example that I shared with Lisa. Uh, the the pivot broke, um, so it was just a mechanical issue and was off for for about 12 hours um, during this this heat dome period of time. And the the yield and the potato quality on that field was off about 20 percent. And so, when we talk about the replacements for the energy and and being able to meet peak power. That's something that that is a, a really big deal. I think even bigger than just this footprint. And, and anyway, having solutions to that is something that obviously is a, a big deal to to irrigators. So, any any thoughts on that part of it? Well, I think uh, that, uh, Blaine, that's really helpful. But I'm thinking, uh, you know, we need to we everybody on the planet need to be thinking about how do we get away from a uh, harmful type of energy. We need to be moving towards solar uh, anyway. I mean, plants figured this out millions of years ago and we haven't yet uh, realized that uh, the byproducts of plants are oxygen and water. <laughs> a couple of things we might need. So we need to move that way anyway. Uh, and you know, the recent reports from the NWEC and something from the Northwest Power Planning Council, I thought, uh, pretty much indicated that we could secure the power uh, to do that. Uh, but if we don't, uh, I mean, we're headed for, I mean, climate change has, has got us uh, by the back of the neck and we can't afford to keep doing that. So we gotta, we gotta move anyway, we gotta do the right thing anyway. And if we can get to clean alternative energy uh, that's climate friendly, we're gonna be better off. So there's no reason to, you know, there's no reason to stick with hydro, which by the way, you know, it's always claimed that hydro is cheap and clean. And I get very frustrated because to some degree it's neither. Uh, we've lost these productive, great salmon runs. You know, I'm gonna uh, break in a second because we're gonna do energy next okay. um, next month. Right. And uh, we'll dig in on this. Um, and one of the, you know, one of the issues that came up, I think during that heat dump for maybe, you know, in the, around uh, Ice Harbor were, uh, were transmission line problems. And, um, and, and that's, you know, that is a, a real upgrade issue that uh, California has been dealing with as I think we're all aware. Um, but we're gonna dig in deep on energy. And so uh, we'll take your question. You'll have to tune in next month blank as we'll take your question there. <laughs> Yeah, I think that it's also helpful to hear this dialogue and conversation because as Blaine was talking and as we were answering it, it felt to me like, what does he expect from himself in this process? And what is he expecting 
from others to give the answers to and to provide in exchange. And I think that can sometimes be a very simple approach to very complex permitting documents, 700 meetings that are follow that and comment periods. Um, and, you know, I, I want to hear more from Joel as well as a commercial fisherman. Uh, Joel will be highlighted and spotlighted um, when he talks and he has a fishing picture. You're a commercial fisherman, Joel, and how long have you been fishing? And what changes have you seen in that time in your industry? Um, let's see, my current boat, I've been, I bought in 1987. So that's a little over 30 years, I guess almost 35. Um, and in that short span, one of the remarkable things is that salmon have been um, diminishing in size. And that that's quite strange, uh, whether or not we can attribute that to uh, anything in freshwater, it, it's unknown. Um, let's see, uh, other changes. Well, there are significant changes in, in freshwater areas as climates have our climate has dried out slightly and gotten slightly warmer. Uh, fish habitat is being restricted and diminished. And so natural spawning salmon have been taking that, uh, taking it in the shorts because of course they rely solely on um, the resources within watersheds. Um, when I started fishing, we didn't have that much trouble with ESA listed species. Uh, in 1987, of course, 1992, um, Smith River sockeye were yes, listed under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, 1994, uh, Snake River Chinook, Fall Chinook were listed under the Endangered Species Act. And that had a significant detrimental effect to the fisheries. They were restricted, they were restricted to conserve um, the Snake River Fall Chinook, the natural spawning Snake River Fall Chinook, and that put a crimp on fisheries from Alaska and a couple of times all the way down as far south as California. Um, that's a short synopsis of 35 years of change. Yeah, it's a, that is a short, very short synopsis and I appreciate that. Um, we also have a question that I'm seeing from the audience that I, I think is very good to consider, uh, especially when we think in terms of partnerships or opportunities uh, for farmers. And sometimes you see these opportunities and you can think, this would be great, it would all align. But there's a lot more to the process that maybe we aren't aware of. Um, but it would be helpful to know uh, from Blaine, you know, what are some, um, what can farmers do in terms of efficiencies and conservation? Um, that's a good question. Um, the, the one thing that, that I hope people realize is, is there is a big incentive for farmers to, to be efficient and conserve, um, cause it, it monetarily benefits us, right? Uh, if we're, if we're wasting water or if we're, uh, not being efficient with our resources, you know, lifting that water and do it, doing things is, is very expensive and impactful. And so um, I hope that is something that, and again, that's love, I'd love to show people around and, and show you what some of that looks like on the ground. Um, Cause I think farmers have a pretty good story to tell on that front uh, that doesn't always get told of, of how efficient we are with our water and with our uh, soil and, and resources to, to, be as productive as we are. I wish I'd taken a picture of your pump room, like the computer screen. Um, I mean, it's, it's a very sophisticated piece of equipment. And we're all invited to the farm. I don't know if all 130 plus participants heard that. We can all go get our potatoes, our wallow, <laughs> our peas. Uh, Blaine is going to be ready for us. <laughs> um, That's right. Free potato. For guaranteed free potato. <laughs> they were really big potatoes, too. <laughs> yeah. I also wanted 
turn it back. They're not little Idaho potatoes. They're Washington potatoes. Oh, they're not potatoes. (laughs) Potatoes. And Liz Hamilton is uh, saying that she's going to bring you salmon. So it's it's on, Liz. Good combination. (laughs) And I also want to turn it back to the whole group and approach this question. um, How do we farm without dams? What are your insights? What's what comes to mind? I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna lean in on this one. Um, so I had heard that that was not possible, and um, I'd heard that from a young farmer who leases um, our family wheat farm. Um, he said that um, yeah, grain transportation that's you know that can be figured out, but um, that removing the dams will put the irrigators out of business, and then. I heard that again uh, at a rally before um, the governor's stakeholder panel in Pasco, and I just thought, really, like, can that really be true? Uh, it just seemed like something we could figure out. Um, and uh, so I embarked on a period of exploration, uh, meeting with irrigation engineers and um, uh, irrigation district managers, uh, and then eventually uh, with Blaine to try to figure out what what that transition period would look like and then what uh, post breaching would look like. And, um, you know, I, I think it's one of those things that's not easy, um, but it's possible. And um, um, it's, you know, and, and uh, you know, there's 90% of the land is managed by um, nine farms. And, and to me, that's a really good thing because there are, um, uh, you know, well-educated, um, uh, you know, experienced farm managers, people who are professionals um, managing those farms. And, uh, and I think they have, I, th- I think they have the ability to make changes and they make changes all the time, every day. This would be one more, big one, but one more. Sorry, Blaine, you can answer now. <laughs> Those are my thoughts. No, no great. And, and, and let me just say, I, I appreciate, uh, you know, I appreciate Lisa, and and all those who because i come at this from a different angle than many people on the call but but i hope everyone knows our goal is the same uh we want farming and fish to both be be thriving um and that's certainly thing i hope um is the end result of of anything that happens um the the reality and and what maybe one thing that i'll mention that that we talk about some if, if you're going to farm and, and in the area uh, we've got, I'm, I'm potatoes and onions and things, things that are annual crops. And so those certainly present some challenges. And I have customers that if, that if I don't produce for a year or two, there, is, there would be consequences. But my neighbors that have orchards, of course, it's even bigger. Um, they've they've got to be able to keep their trees alive or, or there's a tremendous uh, investment and things. And so knowing that in in the invariable low water years that that come it's it's part of this that we we live with that that they, there can you know there is a way that we can have enough water left the fisher are able to thrive but yet the uh the the farmers are able to pump enough to keep their to keep their farms going if if it's unreliable it will change what what you're going to do and what you're going to grow because you'll take less risk uh if if the reliable less reliable so that again not not something that that can't be figured out but but is a definite challenge yeah oh oh, if if i could just follow up on that i you know i i'm from the tri-cities and um i you know i know i remember the dams going in and um I didn't think much about it at the time, honestly, but um, because I was a, you know, kid, teenager, uh, and, you know, we, you know, then went swimming in the (laughs) reservoirs, but, um, but at the time, you know, that, you know, in the 20th century, we really, we, we thought big and we did big things. And um, I, I I believe we can still do those big things. Uh, I believe opening up, you know, this cold water habitat for um, endangered salmon, I, I think that, I think that is our last best hope to recover salmon. And um, I think we can do that big thing and, um, and make that happen. Dave, you wanna add something on to the big things? 
No, I see it as a golden opportunity. That's how I look at it. And uh, the productivity of the river and the importance of uh, the healthy river and the services that the river provides outside of the fish. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult not to do this, but we often just talk about the fish. What the fish represent uh, is just enormous. We have to think about uh, this is, you know, not just about restoring salmon. This is about uh, the economy, the ecology, the cultures, everything that uh, is behind just saying we want to recover the fish. Uh, and so all the, the richness and diversity and abundance, uh, all the life that these fish provide, that's really, uh, I think, what we need to keep in mind. Uh, it's not like hearing somebody say, save the whales. Uh, it's, it's, it's a little different, I think, maybe than that. It's very deep and very broad and cuts across all kinds of cultures and communities. Uh, so That's I'm great. optimistic, I really am. Yeah. Joel, uh, in our last uh, 30 seconds here in the Q&A portion, do you have something to add about uh, fish? You wanna close us out? Well, um... The, the salmon in the Columbia Basin are, I think, like Dave was talking about the cornerstone of the ecosystem. And of course, as you're well aware, the Native American communities that it supported pre-contact were pretty amazing. And I, I think that for us as a society, we have to honor that. Actually, I more than think that because of the of the treaties. And in addition, salmon are unique to the Pacific Northwest. The Columbia River was unique in its vastness in the salmon resource. And to just kind of walk away from that and leave what we inherited from um, the earth. And I know that's more of a Native American thing, but those of us who've migrated here and worked on worked on the land and worked on the ocean, understand what um, pretty much what the earth provides. And to me, it is just an absolute shame and a crime if we walk away from the productivity of the Columbia Basin in terms of salmon productivity and, and leave it in the dirt when it's possible to have that back. So I guess, I guess that's my 30 seconds. Uh, thank you so much to our panelists and offering this insight and additional uh, conversation about this topic. Um, and I just want to leave you with a little bit of our language before I hand it back to Johanna, uh, connecting to what uh, was just shared. Uh, Ichi, Timini, Ticham, Kuwana, Iwa, Nimi. It means that this land and water are a part of us. Johanna? Thank you, Emily, and thank you to all of our panelists, too, for sharing your words. Um, just a quick word to our experts. Uh, you can find the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens, and if there's a question that you feel that you can provide some insight to and an answer to, please feel free to type up an answer and respond to folks. But I wanted to invite David up here with me uh, to provide a bit of some insight into what's going on in D.C. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, greetings, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks for joining us, joining us this evening. Um, as, as you may have heard on the news, uh, the war in Ukraine, there's a Supreme Court nomination uh, that <clears throat> the hearing started on Monday. A lot is going on in DC. Uh, not a lot of focus on natural resources policy or management of the Columbia Basin or Snake River. I, I have always believed that Congress can do more than one thing at a time. Uh, even if sometimes that's proven false, I, I believe it to be true. Uh, so there are a couple of things happening. Uh, <clears throat> relevant to this crowd, and I think um, primarily still the, the Water Resources Development Act um, in Washington. Last week, there was a, um, a hearing that was a member hearing 
uh, where members of the committee, the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, have an opportunity to um, talk about their priorities and what they want to see in a new WERDA bill. That's W-R-D-A, WERDA, Water Resources Development Act. Um, there has been a push, uh, I think as some folks know, to include language in that bill that looks at the Columbia system uh, as a whole and specifically at the Sink River. Um, it doesn't prejudge anything uh, about dam removal or fish management, anything else. Uh, it, it tries to take a comprehensive look at the system to see if it's possible that we could replace the services provided uh, by the Snake River dams. And there are many, including irrigation and farmers, transportation, uh, barging, energy, a whole host of things that make it very complicated. Um, at that hearing last week, we saw quite a bit of opposition to looking at the question within the word of bill. Um, Congress tends to like these water development bills to be bipartisan. So if, if there is very strong opposition to, to looking at the question, uh, it's gonna be difficult to get it done. Um, and I think that we can look at these things and examine them. Uh, to see if there are possibilities. And I think, um, obviously, not to speak for Blaine or anyone else, I, I think that there's a lot of people out there who um, have a lot of questions and would like to see if there are answers. So um, Congress is focused on that as a primary place where we can start to examine some of these issues in a, in a very real, comprehensive way. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure how, how that goes, where it goes, uh, but obviously uh, the Northwest delegation uh, is the primary focus of that effort. Um, and that's Idaho, Washington, Oregon, which in, in that context, there's a lot of firepower there uh, on all sides, obviously, uh, Mr. Wyden in the Senate is chair of the Finance Committee. Mr. Crapo, very senior member of that committee. Um, Senator Cantwell uh, with Environment and Public Works. Uh, Senator Murray with uh, her position on appropriations and in leadership. Uh, that's where the action is within the Northwest. So, um, it, it's going to be a long conversation. It's an important one. I think one that we can um, we can get to some resolution on, uh, but we're going to need everyone's help. And I don't just mean, you know, right, left, farmer, fish advocate, commercial fisher, irrigator. Um, everyone's going to have to come together to figure out how we move forward in a way that works for everyone. Uh, because if that's not the case, it, it doesn't happen. So that's the tone in DC. And so I, I look forward to working with everyone to figure out how we move forward on resolving some of these questions that have been raised tonight. Thank you so much, David. And thanks for naming some of the key players in this work right now as well. Now I'd like to invite Mariska to come on and share some opportunities for our audience to provide input on this issue. Yeah, thank you. So hi, everyone. My name is Marisha Ketchkesh. Um, hopefully you all can see me and hear me. Um, so as Johanna said, uh, I'm an organizer with the Washington chapter of Sierra Club. Um, and a big part of my job is making sure that folks know how to participate in a lot of these big decisions and make sure that your perspectives and your questions get heard by folks that are making these decisions. So um, for those of you who aren't aware, there's actually a lot of opportunity to participate in that process right now, um, kind of where we're at here in Washington state. So Governor Inslee and Senator Murray have initiated a process and are going to be putting out a proposal 
um, this spring and then making a decision of a formal proposal July 31st, which might be a date you hear often over the next six months. Um, are not six months anymore, like four or five months, because time, you know, is an illusion and all that. Um, but something that you can do right now, so proposal, a draft proposal is going to be coming out mid-May, in which there'll be a great public comment process for that. But right now, um, the official sort of um, site and place um, webpage of this whole process from Murray and Inslee has put out a survey that asks um, for folks' inputs on basically all the topics that we've talked about tonight and a lot of you have mentioned in the chat. So it asks questions about, you know, if you have an investment in irrigation, what is your concerns? What are your solutions? What is your perspective? And there's a lot of other opportunity to talk about recreation or transportation or fish and, and anything else. So it's a really great opportunity to take what you've learned today, maybe even learn a little bit more and provide your input because um, as folks are saying, we wanna make sure that when we make these decisions, everyone's getting taken care of. And, um, being a part of that process and uh, asserting your voice in that is crucial to that happening. So that's that's how you can provide your input at this moment. Thank you so much, Mariska. We'll be sure to send out these links as well in our follow-up email, and we'll also try to send the recipes. I know some people were asking in the chat. Um, in our last five minutes, I'd like to invite our panelists and moderator back on to share any final words to close us out. So Blaine and Dave, don't leave me up here by myself, man. <laughs> I'm there for you, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, I, you know, I just say I, I appreciate the conversation. Um, one, one thing that we didn't hit on very much is, is the, the shared, the shared interest in, in working, uh, working towards solutions and, and uh, uh, folks like um, I'll, I'm, I'll single Lisa out because I know her the best that uh, that are truly trying to understand the issues and and see it or I, I think it's wonderful and, and very helpful. I'm, I'm hurt Blaine that you didn't single me out but okay I'll get over it. Uh, I just uh, want to reiterate that we have in front of us an opportunity. Uh, this can be done it's mechanical stuff, it's engineering stuff. And uh, I'd also say that uh, what is kind of the deal breaker and the heartbreaker for me is that if we don't have the courage and the creativity and the commitment uh, to do this, uh, then we are robbing from future generations. We are denying these future generations of uh, what salmon do for all of us. And uh, I'm not just talking about future generations of people. I'm talking about orca and all the other creatures that depend on salmon and all the, uh, the economies uh, that these fish drive and the livelihoods that these fish drive. So uh, I would just end with this. Uh, my good friend Elmer Crow said, you know, if we don't do this, uh, shame on us. And there's no reason we can't do this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I so appreciate, uh, all, you know, Blaine for having, you know, being, I've learned a lot, Blaine, about irrigation and uh, farming. I've really appreciated all the time you've taken to educate me. And Dave, really appreciate um, all that you have to, um, uh, to say. Um, and really glad that you were able to be on. I, um, <laughs> last, uh, last night we did a practice session and we ended up talking about um, the war in Ukraine. And uh, because that really underscored um, the need, uh, you know, farmers like Blaine and others, uh, you know, Washington state really is, they, we, you know, we export a lot of um, west side and east side, a lot of uh, agricultural products. And as a native Washingtonian, I'm very proud of that. We do feed the world. Uh, it's critical to our economy and um, you know, to the health of, of people. And we're gonna be seeing a lot of hunger in the world. Um, it's, you know, the, uh, Russia and Ukraine are big food producers and they will not be exporting. Um, and um, we can't be the people who allowed salmon to go extinct. Like we just, we cannot be those, we cannot, that cannot be our legacy. 
Um, I, I, I think we can, I, you know, I'm confident that we can, we can do both. And, uh, you know, part of getting there is just, you know, talking together and figuring out solutions because when people really, you know, we're all, you know, when people really put their minds to something, they can, I believe we can make it happen. Hi, this is Joel. I guess I'm batting uh, clean up. You, you know, I would just love to be able to provide the marine protein to go with the staples that come from agricultural lands from Washington State. And uh, unfortunately, at the moment, we're not a very big salmon producer in Washington State. And I'd like us to um, have our salmon output at least begin to um, catch up with our agricultural outputs. And, and I believe we can get there. Thank you. And I just want to, again, thank our panelists for the information and insight shared tonight regarding this weighty question, how do we farm without dams? And as we continue to ask this question and gather information, may we approach it with the care and a sense of community that was brought tonight. Um, and since Joel mentioned Marie derived nutrients, I always get a visual and I always like to explain this to my children about the cycle of life and the nutrients. I mean, we take those in omega um, that we buy at the health food store, but these also, those nutrients are needed for our land, for our crops, for our food. And when that goes back into the food, when the bears eat the fish and they poop in the woods or different animals go out, that's how they're adding those nutrients to the land. So when we're thinking of a holistic restoration approach, uh, we do need to think about uh, how it impacts all the resources in the region. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone and tune in. Um, thank you, Emily, so much for moderating, you're a wonderful moderator. Um, and everyone who attended, thank you. Um, we're, the panel's gonna hang on for just a couple minutes um, and we look forward to seeing you next month, the fourth Wednesday of every month from six to 7 p.m. for Snake River Dinner Hour. Thanks everyone. <laughs>